Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. Um, my name is Lindsay Marshall, I'm Director of Data Engagement at the Open Contracting uh, Partnership. And uh, it is uh, six in the morning for me, but I am very excited uh, to be here with all of you. Um, we're so excited to welcome all of you today for the launch of our new guide to EGP implementation based on lessons learned from five African countries. I think people are still uh, coming into uh, coming into the call. So before we dive in, um, some housekeeping, uh, please note that this call is uh, being recorded and uh, it will be shared on social media and other digital platforms. So um, we do ask you to keep your microphone muted while others are speaking, um, but please do introduce yourself in the chat and participate in the chat uh, so that we can get uh, you know, a sense of, of, of who's here and also your contributions. So let's get started. Uh, once again, I'm Lindsay Marchesso, Director of Data Engagement at the Open Contracting Partnership, and we support partners all around the world to make public procurement more open, more fair, and more sustainable through data-driven collaborative reforms. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Edwin Mukamuza, uh, the Head of Africa for OCP, and by Mit Mr. Richard Magambi from Evolve Consulting, who worked with us on the development of the research and guide that we're launching today. Uh, so we're first going to be hearing from them to understand uh, the context for this new guide and its key insights and recommendations. We will then have an interactive panel discussion with our honored guests, uh, Joyeuse uh, Uwengene, the head of the P Public Procurement Agency of Rwanda, uh, Henry Adu Henry Adogan, uh, the head of the Edo, Edo State uh, Public Procurement Agency in Nigeria, and Ms. Florin, Florence uh, Nachayune, Nachayune, uh, the EGP manager from the Public Procurement Agency of Uganda. So I'm really excited to have that conversation and to get uh, their insights from their experiences of implementing EGP reforms. And we're gonna save time for a Q&A session where you can ask questions and share your thoughts as well. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over now to my colleague, Edwin, to give us some context and framing for this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Uh, uh, Habari Zamchana for our colleagues from East Africa. Sabona from the colleagues around South Africa and Edo for the, some of the colleagues in, uh, in um, Nigeria. Uh, we're very profoundly uh, glad that you made time to uh, out, uh, welcome you very uh, richly from wherever you are. Uh, we all know that governments uh, around the world spend about one in three dollars uh, in public procurement. And most of this provides a good opportunity for uh, these governments to meet their development objectives uh, like uh, building roads, uh, hospitals, and health centers. Uh, we know that in many of these uh, places, uh, the public procurement systems have not necessarily met uh, the promise of these uh, objectives, largely because the current paper-based and largely manual system that are being used are not effective in providing the uh, kind of outcomes that facilitate these development outcomes. And in fact, in many instances, uh, systems have been known or, and there's evidence to show that they've been responsible for largely uh, uh, the, out, the opposite of these outcomes, uh, inefficiencies, uh, 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 maverick purchasing, uh, price uh, overruns, uh, and things of that kind. So we therefore, uh, and many partners around Africa, decided to start on the process of uh, uh, automating their procurement systems, uh, largely uh, supported by some of the development partners, uh, particularly the World Bank, and uh, the GIZ in, in some places. And uh, many countries have gone uh, through uh, this process and there are different stages of automating their procurement uh, systems. Some are already piloting, others are in inception stage. And of course, as we know, some have gone beyond uh, piloting. 
So it's now uh, many years that all this has happened. And I think uh, we are in a position to start checking on the way some of these implementations have been done. Uh, the World Bank earlier this year carried out a study and uh, identified three major types of implementation that have been uh, used. Uh, largely are the software as a service, uh, commercial off the shelf system, as well as uh, those systems that are custom uh, made. Uh, with, uh, the, uh, the, 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 with the benefit of the time that has now been spent in implementation, we're in a position to check how this is working. And that's why we carried out this study uh, in a few countries that have already moved. And the purpose was really to check what's going right, what's not going well, and what lessons we can pick so that those who are starting do not make the mistakes the others have made. But also those who have already started can um, adjust. It's not too late to adjust where certain things are going wrong. And the study, uh, as you'll hear shortly after me, uh, has uh, some good findings in that direction. And we've synthesized the report in about eight key lessons that are going to be helpful in uh, guiding those that uh, intend to support the procurement uh, systems automation. These could be the development partners, uh, consultants, or in fact, in some cases, the, the, the governments uh, uh, themselves. We been uh, uh, supporting some of these uh, initiatives in many of these African countries, but the OCP also, of course, has a global footprint with uh, networks in Latin America, Asia, North America, and Europe. And some of these have, of course, gone ahead with the uh, implementation of the procurement systems. And the lessons that they have learned, I mean, they, we, we, there are certain lessons that we can learn from there to benchmark and support uh, countries uh, who have aspirations, of course, of having robust e uh, procurement uh, systems. So I thank you very much for making time to attend uh, this uh, 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 webinar. And as uh, Linz has already said, we have an eminent team of uh, panelists who have very good experience, uh, Florence, uh, Joes, and um, of course, uh, uh, Richard, uh, who will be very, uh, uh, in, uh, will have very good insights on what is working and what's not working well. And I'm very sure we shall take lessons from here. And going forward, of course, we shall continue engaging uh, the different partners across uh, the, the continent to support uh, the fact that they implement the e uh, very well, because it is really, with potential to be a game changer in uh, removing most of the barriers that are affecting a good procurement implementation. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edwin, for that wonderful context and framing. And now uh, I want to hand it over to Mr. Richard Magambi uh, to share with us uh, some of the key lessons learned and insights uh, from the new report and guide. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will go through this, um, well, basically well, the research um, uh, quickly. We have uh, looked at five countries. We spoke to product managers, head of institutions uh, in five countries. Uh, these were, um, uh, these countries were Ethiopia, uh, we had Rwanda, we had Zambia, uh, we had two states in Nigeria, and we had Zambia. Uh, so um, th these countries uh, have, have already gone ahead in uh, the system implementation, as it's been said. And we have learned um, some, we have found uh, a number of things, made observations, and it can be classified in two parts. First, we identified what's working, what's currently working, and what can be improved. Uh, as, as we are forging ahead um, in this EGP. First of all, what's working? Uh, we identified that most countries, I think it was uh, three out of five countries that have already, they planned ahead their EGP, they put that in their ICT uh, uh, strategy or roadmap, which means they have already thought about it and planned ahead um, with uh, a spe specific need that they wanted to solve um, in their local context. Uh, 
Secondly, I, I believe those countries, we, we have Rwanda, we have uh, Ethiopia, we have Uganda. They have already planned in the, around 2010, 20, up to 2014, they had a strategy including EGP. Um, secondly, we have identified countries who, even though they were still uh, in, in their EGP pilot phase, they have already planned ahead on what's going to happen once the pilot phase is finished. They had a, a complete uh, rollout laid out. And um, uh, so actually, uh, let, let me try and share uh, something so that you can follow along. Uh, if, if anyone can share the, the presentation, let me. But I, I will continue anyway, uh, because I don't have the, the access to, to the share screen, I think. So th these countries had already a rollout plan, um, which included a number of years ahead to, to make sure that the EGP is being used by all the countries, uh, I mean, all the, all the MDAs, all the entities, procuring entities in the country. Uh, thirdly, we have identified, thank you. We have identified that uh, most countries um, had a set of governance committees in place. So we are looking at, um, first of all, the, the steering committees, the taking for committees. We're also looking at the implementing agency, which is also important. Um, we also observed a good habit of training all users, uh, including the, the government users, but also uh, training the bidders on how these EGPs, uh, EGP system can work. Uh, these were the four main observations that we that we think are working um, but we can also look at um, what's not working and uh, the next slide please uh, we have observed that in some uh, implementations uh, they were kicked off by the availability of funding so let's say a donor comes and say what can we help you with and say okay how about EGP? Then EGP will get started. But we, what we are proposing, say, as you will see in the lessons learned, it's more, it should be a domestic need uh, that is analyzed with the local context before you get started. Um, and into this, we have proposed uh, a tool, um, which is a get started guide. Uh, this is um, in the main report. Uh, once you, you, can, you can get time to, to read it. We further observed uh, the lack of a dedicated project team. So part of the, the governance committee, uh, part of the governance structure rather, there should be a very strong project management team, uh, which should be the one driving uh, this reform uh, because they, they are the daily management team of this project. And also delays to its recruitment uh, can cause issues um, in deliverables review, in engaging the vendor and so forth. So for this, uh, we have actually proposed, uh, sorry, we proposed a project team a structure with clear positions and whether they are mandatory or not, and when they can be recruited in the, in the process of implementing the EGP. Uh, so please make sure that you're checking that out. Um, another thing we have observed is lack of uh, long-term sustainability strategy for, for the EGP uh, project with the EGP team as well, the EGP uh, system, uh, because you find in many countries, uh, these reforms have been funded by uh, the donors, World Bank and others, but then you lack uh, these strategies to say, what's gonna happen in two or three years when this um, uh, reform, when this particular project, this funding has run out. So there needs to be a sustainability strategy, now long-term, maybe up to five years, uh, looking at what's going to happen to uh, the maintenance of the system, for example, who's going to do it, then this can guide uh, how you, you craft your requirements, how you craft your contracts, and the kind of relationship you have with your, uh, with your vendor. Now, this also maybe you can think of um, uh, your funding model for, for your EGP, the business model that we also recommend later on, I believe. Uh, uh, the other one was where we found that uh, requirements were not so clear uh, because uh, 
poor requirements or unclear requirements will lead to any interpretation by the vendor. And therefore, the system, the resulting system will be very poor. And then you find these uh, issues with contract management, there will be all sorts of issues because what was intended is not uh, what was achieved. So we advise, we also make a recommendation to this and we have provided the link to a sample um, bidding document that you, you can actually uh, benchmark on when you're drafting your, your, your requirements. Uh, the fifth point we have identified is uh, sometimes we find the implementation types. Uh, by implementation type, I mean whether you develop your system from scratch, whether you buy an offshore package and you customize it, or whether you even uh, subscribe to an existing system like um, software as a service. Uh, these choices have been major influenced by the funding deadlines. So let's assume you have um, a grant uh, that's available for two years. You say in two years, there's no way I can be developing a, a system from scratch. Therefore, I'm going for software as a service. Uh, not that software as a service is bad, but we are saying um, simply first analyze uh, what you're dealing with, what's your problem, how you're gonna, you, you, uh, you intend to solve it, and what, what's your context. Uh, for example, the expertise that you have in house, uh, you have uh, infrastructure, the, uh, what you have done in the past in terms of systems implementations of this nature. So uh, it, it's always to start from, from the context and the needs. Uh, the final point of what's not going so well, uh, it's uh, the lack of uh, vendor on site. Uh, so for example, we find some vendors have been operating remotely and these had made communication, um, the local context, uh, in the requirements has been misinterpreted since sometimes uh, these digital communications, while they are good, uh, they're not as efficient when it comes to systems implementations. So we advise that the contract, the requirements, even the bidding document, look at this, um, the presence of a vendor and how communication will be done. Um, next, we'll discuss um, what we what we have learned, what we recommend based on what these findings, what, um, what you can do. Of course, these are complements to the tools that we have already provided. First, we recommend to set clear goals uh, with the clear outcomes. Uh, for example, we want to build an EGP, it's going to solve uh, ABCD problems that's, uh, that's uh, current in our public procurement uh, system that is money. And then once you have those goals, you need to set up a team. Who's going to be following that on a daily basis? Which, who is the implementing agency? And now make sure that you have a number of uh, strong steering committees, uh, high level committees, so that you gain the influence that you need uh, to, 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 to drive this, uh, this important reform. Um, while you are at the start, make sure that you have the sustainability. Like I said earlier, you, you need to, while you're drafting your requirements, for example, you now when you look for funding, you need to look for funding, uh, do your requirements, uh, draft your, your contracts with what's going to happen in the next five years, the next 10 years, uh, so that you, you plan ahead and you make sure that if uh, the budgets or recruitment uh, or any other thing is set in place uh, on time. We also believe that the, the, the legal framework and the policies are a very important tool to, do, to drive digital transformation. And DGP is a very important um, digital transformation uh, component. So really, um, we cannot emphasize enough on the policy and legal framework. For example, if you're bringing uh, electronic signature or digital signatures, these needs to be well supported uh, and of course, in, in mix that with your change management so that everyone understands what's changing. Uh, the other point we have observed that, that, that we recommend is it's better if you involve all your stakeholders uh, at, at the early starts uh, when you're doing your assessments, when you're finding your requirements, especially uh, so that the, the design system is, as, is solving issues or even driving changes that you 
your, your, your stakeholders require. This will also uh, simplify your change management. Uh, another important point I to recommend when you selecting your uh, implementation type, are you, are you uh, buying an existing system? Are you subscribing to an existing or are you even developing from scratch? First of all, look at your context and make sure that your needs are, 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 are a priority and that your local context is, is captured in that need. So for example, um, if you have already developed an IFMIS system, if you have already developed another um, public portal similar to EGP, that means you already have in-house experience of developing these kind of systems. And therefore, you should probably face less uh, challenges than someone who has not um, The last two points uh, in terms of recommendations, um, Solid contract management are important, uh, however, uh, and they need to be uh, crafted carefully, but don't forget that it's a two-way road. So the way you, you want your vendors to, uh, the software vendors to, to, to give you what you want and make sure that they're also catered for, uh, there's a good relationship management going on. Uh, are you paying them on time? Um, uh, the, the payment modality is well captured so that every party is happy and, and you drive it forward, but also making sure that the contract is, is, um, is catering for anyone misbehaving. The final one is make sure that you have a robust change management, and this should be from the start. Uh, it should be cross-cutting even when you have deployed the system, because when you have deployed the system, you, you eventually have issues, uh, technical issues, uh, policy issues that you have not captured eventually. So you need to make sure that this change management spans across as long as the EGP uh, works. And also make sure that you keep building the capacity of, of your users. Uh, the next slide, um, the last one, with all these that we have found out, we thought you know it's very difficult to for everyone to meet this uh, at the same time. But we have uh, came up with four building blocks that we think are minimum to 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 actually get you know starting an EGP reform. First of all, you need to have a local context need. You have to have an, a domestic need with a local context which is backed by solid uh, digital infrastructure for your government users, for your bidders, maybe not uh, in every household, but maybe in major cities or major, major towns, but also with the long-term strategy. What else are you going to, to, to support this reform? How are you going to be reviewing your laws and regulations and the teams and so forth? The second one, you need to have a very solid governance structure. Uh, so. The, the project team we have already highlighted its importance that is uh, there to review deliverables and so forth. We need to have um, uh, steering committees, technical committees, and also you need to have uh, a very solid and influential uh, implementing agency in the government. So uh, for example, if you pick um, uh, a, a, an agency that's not so conversant in public procurement, that does not have the power to enforce certain things, you, you're probably going to struggle. Uh, the third point, uh, when you need clear and comprehensive requirements, and especially with your data in mind, uh, because when you have your requirements and you have not included your reports, um, you, you will need to, to make sure that uh, the reports that are coming out uh, are relevant to what you need. The final one, before I close, uh, you need to have a cross-cutting change management uh, from the start. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, give back the mic to Tabin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. And um, please, we welcome uh, everyone to, to put any comments for Richard or any questions for Richard um, into the chat. And while those questions uh, come in, I think we will turn to our panel discussion because you know now we've heard um, 
from the researcher and now we want to hear directly from our implementers who have joined us today. Uh, so once again, if you've joined us recently, my name is Lindsay Marchesso. I'm Director of Data Engagement at Open Contracting Partnership. I'm honored to be facilitating this conversation today. And I am joined by uh, Joyeuse Uwen the head of the Public Procurement Agency of Rwanda, Henry Adogan, the head of the Edo State Procurement Agency in Nigeria, and uh, Florence Nachayune, uh, the EGP manager from the Public Procurement Agency of Uganda. Um, so perhaps we will first travel uh, travel to Rwanda um, and learn from Joyeuse. Uh, my first question for you, Joyeuse, is what was the biggest challenge that you experienced in implementing an EGP project? And how did you deal with this challenge? Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, thank you everyone for, for participating and uh, I first and foremost thank uh, the uh, Open Contractive Partnership for inviting me to this session as a panelist and also for making this research because I believe it is really very important uh, to all governments, especially African economies. Uh, before I talk about challenges and also um, um, uh, what we managed to do, uh, I think um, uh, the, the, the foundation for us was um, uh, the opportunities for Rwanda. Uh, Many the political will um, that was really um, aiming at eradicating uh, corruptive malpractices in terms of uh, public procurement and also ensuring that we build on ICT infrastructure to be able to deliver services efficiently and effectively. As you know, Rwanda has been ranked as a transparent government and also as a first in Africa as in terms of IT readiness. So uh, we've been able to implement an EGP system, which I believe is really successful because we've been able to cover the entire procurement cycle uh, from um, uh, planning up to contract execution uh, and closing. And for, for, for what are the challenges now we've been facing I think majority of them, I can arrange them from uh, three key areas. The first being um, the, the requirement in terms of uh, satisfying the system um, uh, users uh, and um, the, 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 the continuous demands for, for us to improve more. Uh, another challenge uh, is around the, the change management and the third one is around the infrastructure maintenance. Uh, for the first uh, challenge in terms of uh, satisfying the system functionalities, it was more uh, on um, how do we are we able to adapt uh, the system to a changing environment in terms of uh, laws and regulations. Uh, when we built the system in 2015, which was launched in 2016, uh, we had a uh, regulatory environment of 2007. And later on in 2018, we had another law and also uh, later on a, a new ministerial order. And we were required also to change the standard building document. So as you can imagine, the whole system has to adapt to the new um, uh, regulatory environment, which is uh, somehow cumbersome and sometimes also become challenging to those using the system and um, really putting us a lot of pressure to, to ensure that we, we quickly adapt to that uh, change. Uh, another challenge was more related to how people really think uh, we are able to, to remove the, the human intervention in the system, because some people believe uh, that, that some of the processes were, uh, for, for example, evaluation, where some center committees are able to intervene. Uh, uh, so people were asking, um, asking us, are you able really to fully automate the, the e-procurement in some processes so that we, we really reduce the, the human intervention? Uh, we had other challenges related to adapting to, to other uh, processes like uh, development partners. Now we are in talks with the World Bank where we want to integrate with the STEP system. But again, you see, it's another process that we are going to embark and, and you know, other um, changes has also been uh, affecting the system, which for us is a challenge, but we believe it's also an opportunity. We have challenges also related to different structure in terms of institution using the system. So we have uh, structure at the central level, structure at the local government, uh, and we, we have also structure related to non-budgetary entities. So for those, sometimes the, the institution like schools, they don't even have a procurement officer, they don't have internal tender committees. So how, we, how are we able to adapt 
uh, that uh, to 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 those institutions that are not having um, a normal structure we know in terms of PFM. Uh, I think we will also face a challenge in terms of document management, uh, where every uh, every bid that we have to submit um, the, the document over and over, uh, loading the system. Uh, so we're looking to see how can we be in a position to have at least a, a module to, to have a, a, a way of managing the, the document we receive in the system. And I think a majority of those um, are more linked to do how the, the project has been structured, uh, the, the way we are able to recruit uh, the skills we want on the project. Uh, because sometimes we, we have a lot of going on in the country, we have a lot of projects going on for, for, for online service in terms of government uh, service delivery. And uh, sometimes uh, some projects offer better remuneration to compare to what we are being able to offer. So the, the staff retention, the staff resourcing has been a problem as well as uh, issues related to vendor um, vendor management and also maintenance of, of, of uh, the system. In terms of change management, we face issues related to the misbelief in the system. There are people, uh, again, thinking that someone in the system, the administrator of the system, can go in the system, read the bid, and also be in a position to share information to the competitor. So we, we keep having issues around getting the bids on the last day of, of, of the deadline, uh, and uh, it jams the system as well. Uh, in terms of infrastructure maintenance, it's more of the cost we, we are investing in maintaining, and we think uh, the cloud could be a, a solution. So what have we been able to do, and what are the plans in terms of some of the challenges we face? I think now we've uh, managed to talk to some of the development partners where we, we have a clear roadmap of what we are going to do. We are trying to manage uh, the deployment whenever we make a change to ensure that we don't really disrupt the people. But we are also uh, investing in how we can uh, strengthen the, the, the structure of uh, project management team, where we've agreed on the structure, uh, we've agreed on uh, competitive remuneration to those in, in the project for us to be able to, to, to maintain. And we are also moving to version two, where the system, we, the, the version two will entirely be developed in-house to be able to, to, to ensure the sustainability. I think on the challenges, those are some of the things I can share. And, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joyeuse. Uh, so now we will travel to uh, Edo State, uh, Nigeria. Um, Henry, you're in the process of your ETP project right now. So I'm curious, you know, what are uh, the challenging, um, the challenges that you're experiencing in your procurement system right now that you're hoping or planning for your EGP project to address? Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Uh, first, I must say that I'm very delighted to be on this call. Um, I'm even more inspired and motivated because I can see from the report that a lot of progress has been made in the on the Africa continent. Um, our present system, uh, one of the challenges is human interference in our present system, and we hope that AGP will address this. Human interference breeds corruption in our own opinion. Uh, we believe that the less humans are involved, the more transparent that it will be. So we believe that uh, our EGP will address the issue of human interfession, human interference, which we believe is the root of corruption, of corrupt practices in any um, system. That is very key for us. As we digitize, get more of our MDAs to be on the EGP, we believe that a lot of corrupt practices will be eliminated. Uh, the other issue that we believe that the uh, EGP will address, which we have presently, is that there is a difficulty in data mining in the manual system. You know, um, uh, contract award, some information could be missing and people would want to progress you know, like that. But the EGP system is, such, is structured in such a manner that if a field is not complete in the in the in the planning stage, you will be more compressive quality data, procurement data coming from the EGP system. And this is very key. 
for transparency, for openness, and there are multi users of this procurement data that will now have it to put into their own use for tracking government uh, progress and for providing a platform for citizens to. So it's going to promote more inclusiveness in terms of uh, what we are doing, and we believe that. It EGP as a system, you you know, human beings, we can be sentimental, we can bring some kind of what we do as human on the basis of size of a company, on the basis of the gender, on the basis of any other factors, we should really have no place in, uh, in procurement. And so we believe that this issue or we will actually be addressed by the EGP system. For example, uh, somebody who is to make a decision on a procurement, and those questions have actually been put to me in the past. Oh, you are in a do state. Why are you giving a job to somebody? Talking of a national competitive uh, tender, which limits us to the geographical boundaries of Nigeria. So EGP will not know whether you are from Edo, whether you are from Lagos, whether you are from Kaduna, provided you are qualified based on the defined parameters, then of course you can get a job in those. For us, that will, be, will bring more competition, will remove party by contractors, and then the state will get value for money. Um, there are a lot of delays in our present procurement processes. Somebody is not available, somebody will deliberately uh, delay a file or even keep a file for some days, or, you know, all of this are, are be taken care by the EGP system. If you keep something, if you see your task, Menu and they are tasked with it for you. If you don't deal with them, a uh, flash will be raised. The next hierarchy of authority will know that this thing is with uh, Lindsay, this thing is with Henry. And so you can then take action. You can go looking for file in our previous system. Oh, the file has left my office, the file has gone there, yeah, you are not sure. But the system leaves a trail for you to know who is having the task at the moment that has not done his or her own bit. So that is very, very key. Um, there are administrative inefficiencies in our present system. Okay, just like the similar one that I just mentioned. EGP will take care of this kind of inefficiencies. Somebody not being um, um, on top of what he or she does. Uh, once we have been able to build capacity in every aspect from the, the complete cycle on procurement, we expect that EGP will take care of all of that. We also have problem in vendor profiling for lack of adequate information. Uh, in the EGP, if you don't complete a particular information as a vendor, you can't progress to a level where you can receive notices and you are in a, in a position to tender for any job. So these are very key. And it's just going to make procurement very better, seamless, and at the end of the day, the state will be better for it. So we believe that some of these challenges will be dealt with in, uh, in, the, in the EGP system. We are still at a pilot stage. We are currently doing our, in our four MDAs, which have come for about 70% of our capital expenditure, we are hoping to roll out to more MDAs so that we can cover 90, 95% of our capital expenditure as a state. And so we hope that in the coming um, uh, weeks or months, we are already having this strategy in place to be able to roll out to MDAs so that we can cover a good proportion of our capital uh, expenditure in our annual budget. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Henry. And uh, so now we're going to go uh, to visit Uganda. And um, yes, I think hopefully the participants on the call can tell that we're 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 visiting different countries and contexts because they're at different points in their EGP journey. They've had different lessons to learn, and they have different contexts. So um, each of them has something very valuable to share with us today. Uh, so turning over to Florence, you know, in Uganda, it's been a it's been a long road uh, for EGP and implementation so far. So I was wondering if you could share, especially for those people on the call who may be starting their EGP journey, you know, what's something that you would have done differently if you could go back in time and start over? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Lindsay. I uh, hope you're able to hear me. Okay. So, um, well, there's so many things I would start over because, uh, but, but I'll, I'll really just stick to one, just like the question says, but maybe before even I respond to you, I, I just wanted to give um, our participants a preamble into our journey as a uh, government of Uganda. Um, we have moved between two approaches in a span of four years. 
So you see how crazy it's been. We started off with a custom off the shelf system. And then we midway down the, the, the road, we discovered we were in for a road deal. Uh, we had a couple of uh, contract management challenges with the vendor. So we had to quickly jump in and commence uh, the, the procure uh, the, the, the development of a homegrown or custom grown uh, system. Uh, was it easy? Definitely it was not easy, but um, of course the team was forthcoming and we definitely leveraged the capacity we had built from the first contract. So if you ask me what is something that we would have done differently, personally I would have said that, oh, I would say that I would ensure that the implementation of the system is under one entity. Um, the case of government of Uganda was very unique. Uh, the system um, initiative was sitting with one entity and the funding was sitting in a completely different entity. So what did this mean? Uh, time and again, um, getting the two mandates to sit and agree on one common deliverable uh, was very difficult. And then it even got worse because then a third party came in and a fourth party came in. So you have four implementing entities. All of these have their own mandates. They have their own interests in the project and this definitely trickles down to the decision making now you know it's a project it has a start and an end date but uh, the, the moment you have more than one person having to take a decision this trickles down to the four agreeing before you can move a step forward so a couple of the delays we experienced on this uh, on the project were not entirely because of the initial um uh contractor we had but some of course were the uh, the, the the fault of government uh but even when we moved into the homegrown solution a few of those uh issues because the four are still stuck in there so we still have to um, manage the the, the quadripartite arrangement and uh, for me, I feel uh, that has been taxing, not just to the team, but even from my place as the project manager, because, well, the good part is you get to learn how to manage stakeholders, you get to learn to get political to an extent. But yeah, uh, it's been tough. So if you ask me one thing I would do, I would change, if I had to start all over, I would ensure that the implementation is sitting in one entity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Florence. And uh, and yes, I, I can confirm that that is not a unique situation uh, to Uganda. So it's definitely one, you know, institutional cooperation and, and uh, cross institutional efficiency in these projects is very important. And, and there's some guidance in the report on on some of the ways um, that this can be hopefully uh, dealt with um, for others who can learn from your experience, Florence. Um, so Florence may ra raised uh, the the topic of what, you know, what kind of system uh, to build. They started with a custom off the shelf uh, project in Uganda and then moved to a custom build. I think uh, Henry in Edo State, uh, there was some considerations between custom build, uh, uh, customized off the shelf and software as a service as different options for the model to pursue. Uh, can you share with us a bit on how you decided and which, which factors you considered um, in which, uh, type of implementation to pursue? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Lindsay. Uh, for us in Edo State, uh, we knew the discussion about uh, EGP uh, started way back in 2017, 2018. I remember in 2018, we had a meeting with the World Bank where options were being considered. And uh, from that meeting, um, I started to think that for purposes of uniformity across Nigeria states, for ease of um, experience sharing and peer learning, it will be good if we can all have a um, similar system. And the system we are all looking at at that time was um, a SaaS solution. So that was very key. We wanted to show where we can you know, cross-fertilize ideas, share our experience with other states in Nigeria, as well as provide an opportunity for peer learning. That was key. Um, for us, for my little knowledge at the time about systems, we were very clear that we will not go through a very long development journey. For a custom system, you will have to go through a very tortuous and perhaps rather expensive development journey. For a SaaS solution, it's just deployment and operationalization. And so we, we were cautious that we, don't, we are not prepared to go through 
that very difficult or laborious uh, development journey, which could have serious cost implication. That was key. Uh, for us in our environment as a soft national, we don't have all the resources. So we believe, and we also um, had confirmed this with other colleagues from other states, that for you to actually decide on a custom built um, a solution, you must have a very strong internal IT personnel who will be able to sit down with the developer to define user requirement that will be optimal, underline the word optimal. So because of our low level of IT personnel and the capacity at the time we were starting, we felt, look, how can we define, correctly define, instead of going back and forward, let's opt for a SaaS solution where we don't have to uh, necessarily have very super IT people who will sit down to define the IT, our user requirement with the developer. So that was key. Um, we talked of scalability. If we build a system now, a custom build, two, three years down the line, perhaps it's becoming obsolete, it's no more meeting our requirement that we are thought of at the beginning. What do we do? Do we scratch and start all over? We say, okay, why don't we go for a SaaS solution? If, uh, if we need to upgrade, if we need to upscale, the vendor is there at the back end to always you know, support with all of that. So that was also key. We also uh, looked at the, the duration. At the time we started, we were, we were, I can say we were in a hurry to get started. And so no one was going to be patient with us to go the route of uh, a development journey. So the relative deployment period was very key. Once we hooked on to a SaaS solution provided by a particular vendor, we know it's a matter of days, we are live and we are uh, on the ground running with our uh, EGP solution. So that was also very key. We also know that just like we have um, other applications locally, we know that if we hook to a SaaS solution, we know that once the vendor is able to provide update, then all those updates automatically, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we subscribe to them, we are on. We don't have to do much. So this were the consideration that we had you know, in uh, opting for a, a SaaS solution. You know, again, uniformity, peer learning, experience sharing, uh, cost efficiency, a short duration period for deployment, internal IT capacity, scalability and convenience, and finally, upgrade and new release, which will get at little or no cost from the vendor. So this was a prime consideration in our situation in, uh, in uh, those state as a subnational in Nigeria. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, uh, Henry, for sharing those insights. All right, we're going to uh, travel back to Rwanda now. Um, so, uh, Shoyu, as we've already asked you about the challenges that you experienced, but you know, now that you have implemented your EGP uh, system and it is up and running, uh, I'm wondering what positive results you can share uh, so far from the experience of having an EGP system and if all that work was worth it. Thank you very much once again. Uh, I think um, uh, for us, we know what are the results, but uh, we, 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 we tried another approach of uh, asking other people to tell us what they perceive as the results. So uh, in that framework, we conducted two assessment reports about uh, Rwanda EGP system. One was at the level of the satisfaction uh, from the users, both uh, procuring entities and also um, the suppliers or bidders. Another one was um, about the quality assurance of EGP system uh, or mutual system, uh, which was done by PwC Mauritius. Uh, both reports came up with um, commendable results. And um, uh, actually, uh, when we look at the satisfaction survey bidders, um, and this was done actually, the both assessment were done in 2021. And, and both um, uh, bidders and suppliers in terms of um, uh, satisfaction, uh, they, they perceive uh, Omucho EGP system of Rwanda being uh, at a satisfaction level of 75.95%. Uh, but on the side of procuring entities, uh, this satisfaction goes up to 96.63%. So maybe the discrepancy between the two was mainly um, um, on the areas related to reducing fraudulent practices and uh, reducing corruption uh, loopholes. Again, uh, this is a perception because um, uh, when I explain about the challenges, uh, we have a challenge in terms of misbelief. Though we believe we have a lot to do in terms of system enhancement, uh, fully automation, we are even looking at so to add artificial intelligence. 
uh, but still uh, some that, that misbelief maybe uh, in um, on the side of bidders they think maybe some people might even uh, look at some of the information and share them with other people we have also some cases where people say uh, uh, when um, the, 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 the procuring entity has finished the evaluation, sometimes um, one of the tender committee members might um, call the, the, the potential successful bidder uh, to give something for them, uh, uh, pretending that there are some of the documents missing, they might lose that tender, though they are potentially successful. So out of ignorance, some people might believe in that and not believing in the system. So those are some of the perception that we, we are really um, looking at and trying to address in terms of capacity building. But when we look at the satisfaction level, we believe on both sides, uh, it is really satisfaction. And some of the, the, the indicators that we were looking at is more on saving the time, saving money, increasing efficiency, increasing uh, transparency, um, fighting corruption, um, making information available, uh, improving in terms of monitoring and auditing, uh, reporting and um, accurate uh, statistics. So uh, for, for us, we, we are okay with, the, with this satisfaction and we believe uh, it is also giving us a, a homework to keep improving. So on the side of um, PWC Mauritius also, uh, uh, EGP system of Rwanda was um, uh, qualified as, as a more advanced system even closer to the best in class. So it was uh, um, uh, compared to those of uh, system in the developed countries. And uh, in terms of usability of the system, uh, at 83%, um, bidders confirmed that the system is really uh, flexible, uh, user-friendly, and has reached uh, expectation at 83%. So uh, for us, uh, I think the results was uh, mainly com uh, a combined effort from our partners. Uh, we even engaged the civil society beyond suppliers. We engage uh, more partners for us to keep developing, improving. And we believe um, uh, even for African economies, it is always good to learn from uh, where it has succeeded and what they can do, especially for those who have not uh, probably implemented the EGP systems. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Joya. So we've uh, we really had an interesting discussion so far. We've talked about uh, institutional arrangements. We've talked about you know EGP strategy, uh, choice of implementation type, and we've talked even about uh, some of the other uh, challenges and success factors. Um, but it's been kind of um, alluded to in, in multiple of the contributions so far today, you know, there, there is, a, it is a difficult thing to introduce change, to introduce new technologies, new ways of doing things. There's going to be people who might resist, um, people who might not understand, people who have difficulty um, in, in adopting new ways of doing things. So I'd love to now uh, go back uh, to Florence in Uganda to ask about how you're approaching um, change management, any kind of key insights or lessons learned about how to do change management as part of an EGP project. And also um, picking up on, on one of Olive's questions in the chat, if you could highlight how, how civil society engagement has been part of that process. Okay, thank you so much once again. Um, change management. First and foremost, um, I would like to confess that uh, change management is uh, is an aspect we didn't start off from the uh, start with from the inception of the project. And if anyone would, uh, if I were to advise anyone going to do an implementation, I would tell them it has to start from the word go, because you cannot separate change management from project management. Uh, that notwithstanding, what did we do subsequently? Of course, the first. Um, the first step we took was doing a stakeholder analysis. It was important for us to map out our stakeholders so that we were able to know uh, where they fall. Uh, uh, that is power versus influence. So uh, as well as power versus interest. So when we did this, we were able to establish who they were, uh, when to communicate to them, how to communicate to them, or even how to engage them. Now, having done that, uh, 
the EGP implementation itself, because it is uh, the, the scope is quite huge. We had to uh, um, put out work groups. One of the work groups uh, on the implementation team was uh, the change management and training uh, work group, which uh, sits with our public procurement authority. Now, this work group, of course, leads the change management agenda. But then uh, through this work group, we also ensured that each of the entities that was enrolled on the system nominated a change agent. Now, of course, we, determine, we, 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 we defined the terms of reference for the change agents for these entities. It was not so much about them being procurement people, but people who can cause a, a, an evolution, people who can cause change at an entity. So through this change management work group, uh, they ensure that on a fortnight basis, they engage these change agents who subsequently trickle down the information coming from the project management unit or from the project implementation team down to, to, to um, to the entities that we've been enrolled. That's on the side of the entities. Uh, but also, again, on the side of the entities, we have time and again taken up uh, on-site on change management engagements. And we usually start critically with the management teams as well as the procurement units. That is for the purpose that um, the fish, for us, we believe the fish rots from the head. So it is very important that we have sponsorship support at the entity to drive the change they are in. But also, we also believe that the procurement, uh, the procurement and disposal units are the, uh, it, that is the home, the PDU is the home of, of, of the adoption of this system. So we always ensure that as a means of change management, we involve them um, deeply in this so that they can actually run. But also it helps us not so much not only about the change management, but even in terms of sustainability, because we're able to continue with the rollout when we have been able to create the change we need within the PDU. The PDU always has a way it drives the entity on as we move to the other entities. And of course, uh, given uh, the time we went into production, that was about, um, we, we had the, 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 the first solution getting into production on 1st of July, 2020, and then we had the indigenous solution get into production on 17th of August, 2020. That was around the time we had the COVID pandemic and we were in a lockdown mode. So we needed to look for alternative ways to get to, 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 to our stakeholders or to do the change management. So quickly we adopted a, um, an online strategy, which uh, engaged, uh, we, uh, entailed the change management engagements, as well as the trainings. We came up with a quick reference guides of the systems that we could share with the users. That way they could be able to use them for, for, for their training. We developed voiceover material. Basically we developed uh, items that the users could be able to use to create the change we need on their own. Of course, given the, 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 the circumstances that, that where they are in. However, we also know that uh, as a means of making the change sustainable, we needed to get the business owners, and that is the procurement fraternity. It was important for us to get the procurement fraternity to buy into this and to drive this. So what we've done is that we're continuously working with them. We ensure that almost every six months to a year, we do um, a, a training session, a sensitization training uh, through the procurement uh, bodies. Uh, case an example is the IPPU or the SIPs fraternity in Uganda. But on the side of the bidding community also, we go through the, the, the umbrella bodies in which they uh, that, that run them or that speak to them. Case an example is the private sector foundation, Uganda, the Uganda Manufacturers Association. So we try to, 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 to push it closer to the people through these uh, bodies because they are the ones that deal with each of the um, categories of people um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. However, for civil society, of course, these are very critical. And for them, from, from the word go, we have always involved civil society. Why? They are always the people who will tell you what you don't want to hear. And they will tell it to you openly. So we know that we need them. Now, what we usually do is that we have engagements with them where we update them on the status of where we're at where we, and where we're going. Of course, they will always tell you, what is right, what is wrong, then you're able to put it right. But we've ensured that we move with them along the journey. We've done a couple of demonstrations to them and we continue to do it because we need them to, 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 to be the third eye that will let us know if we're moving on track because ultimately at the end of the day, we're driving, um, uh, achieving government's objectives for automating public procurement. I hope I've answered your question, Lizzie. 
Thank you so much, Florence. All right, so now I think we're going to turn uh, to the Q&A because the questions have been pouring in uh, over the course of our conversation. And I'm going to try to synthesize them and group them uh, so that we can answer them effectively. So um, the a, a quick one for, uh, so first I'm gonna summarize the questions and then I'll hand it off uh, to each of you in turn um, to answer them. Um, so there was a quick one for Florence, which was whether the issue of the four institutions uh, collaborations has been sorted out. Um, so when you when it comes to you, Florence, maybe you can give an update on whether that has been resolved and, 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 and how that was resolved. Um, there's a question also um, uh, from, from Tracy Okoro, uh, that's basically about the change management, experiencing that uh, that a lot of government staff um, kind of displayed some lethargy related to uh, distrust of uh, senior government officials and executives. So the question is whether um, in the Rwandan or Nigerian context that was experienced as well, um, and if there was any um, any solutions that you can share. Um, then we can go that there was a question from uh, Tedes uh, from Ethiopia, um, which was asking about how the bidders uh, were engaged uh, to use the system. So maybe that's something that uh, Joyeuse could shed some light on. And then there was also a question about um, integration with other systems and whether any problems occurred due to system integration. Um, so if any of the three of you uh, are are grappling with system integrations with IFMIS and the like, um, please do share your insights with that regard. Uh, there was a question um, from Andrew about, and I think this also links to a question from Olive about, you know, data quality and completeness. So, you know, what measures um, are being put in place to encourage um, the, co the correctness and the completeness of the data within the systems? And um, a question from Aliyu in Nigeria about the Ugandan experience on the issues of vendor for deployment and kind of wanting a few more details about uh, why the originating vendor contract was terminated and you know what the lessons are can be learned from that experience um, from Florence. And um, just leaning closer so that I can read. Uh, so uh, Olive also had a question uh, related to open data, the open contracting data standard and the OC for IDS. Um, so just uh, whether uh, there are plans in place for implementation of open data standards, you know, to publish open data from the EGP systems and the potential benefits from that. I think we'd love to hear from all three uh, panelists on that question. And finally, we had a question um, from Mark, uh, who, you know, a bit of a controversial question, which country in Africa has made the most progress in implementing an EGP system? Um, and for that, I want to first highlight that in order to undertake this research, um, one of the things that, that we did together um, with Richard and his colleague Willie was to define a framework, um, some success indicators uh, that we could consider in, in analyzing the EGP project implementation. So perhaps we could ask Richard, um, um, to highlight uh, a few aspects of that, and you know, if he dares, uh, give an opinion on on which has made the most progress um, of the three. And finally, a couple ones just trickled in that of that I will come back to in the second round because I think we have so many that we have to answer so far. So with that, um, may I please uh, turn it uh, back over. Uh, to Joyeuse um, to highlight uh, the answers on on kind of how they overcame issues of uh, distrust if if you encountered that amongst government officials how you include uh, how you engaged uh, bidders and if there's any lessons learned from system integrations and your plans uh, for publishing uh, open data or working on data quality and completeness. Thank you very much uh, for, for the questions. I, I think I'll try to attempt to some of them. Uh, for, for the issue of distrust, um, I think for the case of Rwanda, I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, but again, in the context of Rwanda, um, I think that is where I started. Uh, we should understand that Rwanda uh, draws the EGP system from other strategies and also uh, uh, even um, 
the, the cost that was involved in having offline uh, processes in terms of public procurement, which in sometimes was even um, giving bad perception to uh, staff in procuring entities that they, that they are subject to corruption. They are uh, so even themselves, they were some, somehow not comfortable. And, and everyone in, in the country was really pushing for, for that agenda and for that uh, uh, vision to have this process uh, automated really was a need from everyone. So I uh, have not expressed of, of any case of distrust uh, as uh, for, for the case of Rwanda, to me, it was a, a combined effort and everyone willing really to have this system in place. So how do we engage bidders? Uh, in terms of bidders, um, first of all, um, we understand that bidders, they are not everyone uh, is not on the same level of understanding, not on the same level of IT, ICT literacy. So we've already put in place um, huge budget in terms of um, partnership with other partners to have dedicated uh, budget to train uh, these uh, suppliers and bidders, especially how do they bid, uh, what are the changes whenever we have changes ETC. But on the other side, we have established a call center that is um, functional uh, to help the, the, the bidders whenever they encounter any challenges, uh, how can we facilitate them? We have um, a, a whole unit in, in, term, in, in, in charge of support uh, dedicated to, to suppliers, but also other bidders. Uh, we have also introduced um, um, chatbots uh, through Umucho system where someone can interact uh, uh, with the lady, uh, it's more of artificial intelligence um, to to help those in need to be facilitated. So we invest in, in capacity building uh, programs, but also in tools that really can help us to interact and um, uh, support the, the builders. Uh, for, for the integration between um, Umucho, the UGP system of Rwanda and IFIMIS, it, it has been implemented especially because we wanted to have a complete uh, procurement process cycle implemented in Rwanda. Uh, it was implemented last year. That's where we included the contract management module in the EGP. Uh, so for us, um, the challenge was only on the side of rollout because again, uh, whenever you launch a system, you never know what happened, uh, where, what could happen. So we work together with the, the IFIMIS system and also the EGP Omocho system team for us to manage the, the crisis. But uh, I think that was the only challenge we faced, but in terms of um, the, the readiness of both system uh, and also the willingness of uh, both uh, the Minister of Finance, which is also the, the, the administrator of IFIMIS in our system, uh, it, it has also been um, well, uh, smooth and, and uh, and uh, we, are, we are also connected and integrated with other systems. So for, for data quality and completeness, what are we trying to do? Um, we've had cases where uh, sometimes uh, whatever is being planned, and we had cases where people, uh, sometimes they do even procurement offline without authorization. Uh, first of all, we will work closely with the Office of the Auditor General to ensure that everyone is working in the system. But when we integrated with IFIMIS, we started from planning. Every information that we need at, this, at the level of planning, we need to have it uh, in, in part of the planning. So uh, when we do monitoring, we are able to know um, everyone, especially for those who request authorization to work offline because of different issues. So we are able even to capture them uh, later. So we have now an offline uh, module where if you have awarded a tenant outside the system, we, are, we, we bring you back to the system where you need to report offline and continue the contract management in the system. So this has helped us to know everyone who is doing procurement, how is this linked to the budget that they have been uh, given to that particular activity. Uh, if there is any budget revision, it has to also to reflect in the procurement plan ETC. So we are able really to capture all the information starting from planning, and this has been able to, to be implemented through the integration with IFIMIS. So I, I'm not, for, for open contract and open data, um, we are really in discussions, and I think a majority of the issues uh, people are facing when it comes to open contract. So uh, understanding if there's any national, uh, international standard in terms of open contracts, I think everyone is asking themselves, do we have any standard that we should follow? 
or people or countries should uh, decide on what information to disclose, which I think is also more importantly for, for us to engage institutions like open contracting. We've had discussion with World Bank. So I think for Rwanda is where we want to be, but how to do it is where we are trying to consult to understand how better to implement that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joyeuse, and I'm I'm happy to share that that a stan international standard does indeed exist, the Open Contracting Data Standard, um, which is being implemented by I think more than 30 governments around the world. Um, more than half of the population of Latin America now lives in a country that publishes open contracting data, and it's been incredibly useful for monitoring um, procurement performance and um, and achieving uh, results. And we're really excited excited about the next frontier about being able to use data to monitor progress against green procurement, uh, inclusion, and other aspects of sustainability. So Joyeuse, we would, uh, we would be happy to, to talk more and explore how we could support you uh, to implement the open contracting data standard if that would be of interest. Uh, but with that, we're going to travel uh, back to Henry in Edo State of Nigeria. There were um, several uh, questions that I think speak to your experience. Uh, one question from Andrew was, uh, you know, when you spoke about the considerations and the different implementation types um, that you considered uh, and ultimately uh, how you landed on where you are, he was wondering if you had any any insights about what challenges you are experiencing with the system that you've adopted so far and if you'd be willing to share them today. Uh, a couple of other questions that might be relevant uh, for you as well uh, related to this question of uh, building trust or overcoming distrust uh, in, in getting people to adopt the system. And there was also a question um, in the chat, I think it was from Olive, about you know, the decision to pilot in a, few, in a few MDAs rather than roll it out to everyone at once and whether, uh, you know, whether a, a wider or a smaller rollout, um, what advice you can give on that question as well. And of course, we invite you to touch on any of the other aspects uh, that have been raised in the chat as well. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, let me start with the issue of uh, distrust among the top government functionaries. Uh, in our sub-national, I will not really say it was a case of distrust. I think that people were generally apprehensive. Uh, nobody was sure exactly what the Ipukema was going to bring. Like I told you um, when I was making my comment earlier, we believe that uh, human interference with procurement breeds corruption. We are very convinced on that and positive on it. And so within us, we knew that going E, would deal with most of the issues that um, are very uh, susceptible to corrupt practices. Um, I'm sure the people in government and other stakeholders also know this, and so they were apprehensive. What we did was to articulate messages. We started harmonizing, telling them, look, as a subnational, resources are dwindling, because in our country, we have federated states that go to the federal every month to share whatever is available to share in terms of monetary you know, allocation. And so we made them to understand that what was being shared every month at, in Abuja was dwindling. Because when I go to FAC where they shared the monthly allocation, what they come back with was uh, fluctuating very widely. Sometimes they get something that's good. At other times, some are even getting nothing and all of that. And so we started convincing stakeholders within government at the, at the very top level that look, the only way the future of our state lies much with e procurement. We must now begin to make very, very judicial use of our very scarce resources so as to be able to deliver to the vast majority of our citizens. And that message kind of stuck with a good number of them from the very hierarchy. Yes, it is good that we use our very small resources in a very disciplined, prudent manner so as to touch the vast majority. I think that was really, that message was really a game changer. So uh, yeah, I won't call it distraught, but I was apprehensive because I believe a lot of them benefit one way or the other from the manner of procurement. And they were thinking, oh, perhaps I won't be able to benefit in this electronic system. We put that, you know, uh, at the sideline and show the positive, what can we benefit as a people from going E? And we started to make the argument that look, if we go E, with our little resources, we can do more for our city in terms of education, in terms of our healthcare and all of that. And that message gained a lot of acceptability and publicity 
and uh, we had uh, very little resistance at that level. Um, the other issue that I want to talk about, somebody asked why four pilot MDA, why do you not have a massive ruler? Well, this is relative. We are a subnational. Our population is 4 million, and our total uh, budget, annual budget is in the region of 150 billion. Okay, so we have, we have covered with those four MDA that we chose about 70% of our capital expenditure, and we're planning to do more. Uh, we were careful not to take on two more than we can um, uh, contend with at a time. We knew there was going to be resistance. And so starting with this MDA, we were careful to push it gradually to a level where the reform agenda becomes irreversible. And that is now we have now had top level discussion with our government to roll out to more MDA where we can cover about 90, 95% of our capital expenditure. So for our police in other country, your scenario may not be exactly like we have in Edo State. So, but we started with four and we're going to do more, but our objective at the end of the day is to ensure that we are covering through our portal, electronic portal, about 95% of our annual capital expenditure, which we believe if we achieve that, it will go a long way in helping us to manage our resources very, very prudently. Um, on the issue about OCDS, data quality and all of that, we have seen from the little that we have done over the past two years or so, that e-procurement generates the data in terms of the quality and completeness very seamlessly. And so we have been publishing in OCDS format for the winer and um, um, we have engaged with uh, civil society and other Stake, uh, stakeholders in our environment, and they commend the quality of the data and the completeness in terms of what they are doing. We have um, two organizations around that work with us closely, one and NEDGE and DataFight. They are able through our publication, able to monitor some projects and find that the project are on ground, they are being done to certification and they are happy. So we receive all of this feedback. So I think that uh, depending on the size of your economy, whether as a subnational or as a country, you may choose at what level you are going to roll out and, uh, and, uh, and uh, build on. Um, the other issue is about um, um, uh, what we did with our bidders. Yes, we, what we did, we knew there was going to be resistance, especially from internal stakeholders. So we made our migration from the analog system where we had a database of registered vendors so many of them. We said, if you want to get on the E, migrate free of charge at no cost. Up to this moment, we are migrating vendors from our manual system to the EGP at no cost, just to ensure that we have enough vendors who we are going to deal with. That will not continue uh, ad infinitum. When we have stabilized and we now found that this reform has come to state, has become a culture, then we can begin to see how we can you know, commercialize the portal and all of that. For me, that should not be the, the beginning. That should come towards the day end when we have stabilized, when it has become a culture in our environment. Government must, for the start, drive e procurement as a social investment, like you have in education in ed. So we are not thinking of commercializing now, we are thinking of gaining acceptability beyond you know, a reversal before we begin to add other things. I think those are the issues that. Uh, um, you drew my attention to. If there's any other one, I'm available to speak to it, Lindsay. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Henry. Yes, our challenge is that we have so many questions and so little time. So <laughs> trying to see if we can get to all of them. Uh, so with that, maybe we'll head over to Florence. Uh, there were a couple of questions that were specifically um, dedicated to you, including, yep, wanting to know what happened with those uh, four institutions, um, as well as... Um, uh, questions about the plans to uh, implement and publish the open contracting data standard. Um, I think also to speak uh, to the question of uh, bitter engagement. In fact, uh, Tadis supplemented his question asking whether um, there is a specific procedure or policy for supplier registrations, whether the supplier presence in person is required uh, to verify their registration. So if you could um, speak to that question, I think that would be really appreciated, as well as if you wanted to speak to any of the other uh, issues that have been highlighted uh, so far. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> and again, thank you for, to our members for the questions. First and foremost, what did we do for the four entities? Uh, what we did is uh, 
of course, we knew we needed to get into a collaboration. So it was very important that the roles of each of the entities was marked out. So each of them knew uh, their specific parts to play on the system. We had one that had to take ch uh, charge of change management and training. The other took charge of uh, the ICT policy. The other took lead in the implementation and the other and took lead in the infrastructure itself. So each of them knowing what they're supposed to do so meant that they each pursued a given uh, a given direction. And of course the governance structures has representation from all the four. So when all the four keep meeting with time and again when there are different governance structures are meeting, all the four report on their man on their on their uh, activity that is cut out for them on the project. So it was very important to have everyone have a specific deliverable and then fast track that one and report on that one. That's the only way we're able to get them to 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 um to, to work together. There's a question on integrations. Uh, I, I probably want to 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 let the members know that for government of Uganda, we were supposed to have nine point to point inter, um integrations on the system. Uh, we actually achieved six on the indigenous system. On the uh, initial system, we had the, the court system. We were only able to achieve one, which was the business registration system. We had failed on, on the others. Why did we fail? Time and again, it's very difficult to um, have technical discussions, especially when it comes to integrations online. It is important that the vendor has on-site presence. Now that became easier with the indigenous solution because uh, the, 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 we, the the vendor was based in the project management unit. So the technical discussions were faster, the consultations were faster, and therefore were able to, to, to close in on the biggest number of critical integrations. Case an example, we integrated with the integrated financial management system. We have an integration with the business registration system. We have an integration with the SMS notification gateway. We have an integration with the ETAC system. We have an integration with the payment gateway system. So we have about three left. Just that's just the NSSF, the digital signature, and the and the, uh, and the identification system. So it is very important that. The, the proximity of the technical teams is very important in you getting it right with the integrations. But yes, it is actually possible to have the system integrating. Uh, thirdly, uh, some of the measures personally, or, or in the case of government of Uganda that we put in place to ensure data accuracy is we have a team uh, and we call it, we, we actually have two teams. There's a work group called the application implementation team. And then we have a, a, an audit and security team. These to work hand in hand. Uh, and uh, th their role there is, is to work through the requirements, uh, of course, taking them down the requirements traceability matrix, but also have the audit and security team quality assure what is happening or what is being pushed through by the application implementation team. So it is important to, to cut um, these roles out. The, the, there is the, the, the system functionality and then the quality assurance, but also the other uh, attributes that we took as government of Uganda is we took on a third party quality assurance firm, which uh, had to go through the data. Part of what they're going through is the correctness of data to make sure that um, what we have at the end of the day is what we are supposed to have. Then there was a question was on, on um, what are some of the key lessons we learned with the original contract that failed or why did it did even fail? Like I mentioned, we had a couple of contract management challenges, but bottom line, uh, what are our key lessons? I'll, I'll, I'll put them in four areas. At the pre-tendering stage, uh, one of our topmost lessons there is that it is important as government of Uganda, to, uh, as a government, not just government of Uganda, to have a clarity on the requirements and to have a clear understanding between the different government agencies, especially between the, the, the agency that's doing the implementation and the integrating entities. The moment uh, within intergovernment, you're not, you, you don't have a, a firm position or an agreed position on the requirements, it becomes very difficult for the vendor to definitely follow through the implementation. But also that definitely trickles down also into the change request you're going to have because your position is going to keep changing time and again. But also specifically in terms of integrations, you need to check the vendor's understanding of the requirements pretendering stage because time and again, they will tell you, yes, of course it will be a checkbox, they'll check. But then when you get to the implementation, then 
there's a lot of jibber jabberish. They, they, they seem not to, uh, your understanding and the vendor's understanding seems to be very different, which is one of the reasons why a couple of uh, uh, countries that have tried to do the integrations are not successful. Then at the tendering stage, it is very important that you do the benchmarking. You do not need to fall with where others have fallen. So do benchmarking, check with countries that are successful, check with countries where the specific vendor you're interested in has actually had a successful implementation. And when you're doing these due diligence um, visits, ask the questions that matter. Ask the questions that matter. Because uh, unfortunately for us, when, when it came to government of Uganda, we only got response, the right responses we needed to take the decision in the middle of the execution. So, I mean, we had already started going down the road. Had these questions been asked at the start, I don't even think government would have gone down that road anyway. So you need to ask the questions that matter. Again, look out for a system that is flexible. When you go for a system that is hard-coded, change requests are going to be the order of the day. And of course, uh, for us, what happened with us? The system was hard coded. We didn't see this from the start. Midway the journey, we realized it's hard coded. The cost of the change request. I mean, we had we were only we only piloted with six entities out of three hundred and fifty five entities, and what a change request of thirty five percent of the contract price. That is why government had to think twice because definitely this system was not going to be sustainable. Then we were um, using World Bank funds, but the bank was going to be out in two years. What did that mean? After the two years, we would not have sustained this and would have gone down to zero. So it was important for us to quickly run up with a custom uh, made solution where we have made uh, quite good progress therein. During the tender, the development and the go live stages, be mindful of one of two things. Ensure that the vendor has on site presence. There's a lot of this detail that is lost in translation when it comes to online engagements. There are things, the technical aspects of a system that you can only close when you have proximity. So ensure that the vendor has on site presence, not just for knowledge transfer, but for you to be able to. To, to have a clear understanding of the technical requirements. Um, you talked about the plans to implement OCDS. This is actually our next stage for government of Uganda uh, on, on, on our indigenous system. We're looking at actually um, contacting OCP because we do need help with now uh, implementing the open contracting data standards because this is part of the requirements of the system. So it is one thing that we need to pick up, but also because it's an indigenous system, we are looking and we're now pursuing the registration of intellectual property rights. And then we're moving to ISO standardization because we need to make sure that our system is internationally uh, recognized or is internationally accepted, which definitely now will make the, the, the subsequent um, integration say with STEP and other development partner funded systems or rather, development partner systems much easier. Um, what have we done in ensuring that our supply, our supply, do our suppliers have to be available for registration? No, they're actually doing self-registration. We made, uh, first of all, the graphical user interface of our system is very user-friendly. We made sure that the suppliers can easily follow through. We also uh, uh, generated materials that they can easily follow through, but we make sure that we opened up the project management unit, even for those who are not able to, to, to follow through so that they can get help. We have an active uh, service desk, but we also do provider training every Friday, 10 to midday. We are interacting with that program not just for registration, by the way, but for all aspects for which they're concerned about on the system, because we need to move this journey with them if we're going to ensure success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florence. And with that, we are basically at our time, which devastates me because there are so many amazing questions still coming through in the chat. So we're going to have to think about how we could possibly set up uh, some more opportunities for peer learning or bilateral learning on, on these topics um, since, since everyone is uh, so passionate. Um, with a very final word, I might ask Richard uh, just to speak to the, um, the question about kind of the, the indicators framework for the success and uh if he wants to 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 attempt uh to offer mark's question but it's totally fine to to say that no one's perfect and and everybody's making progress uh over to you richard for the final word uh thank you very much lindsay um thank you everyone for for the attendance uh, i i think the question is difficult as you you, you alluded to um i think we, different countries started in different times uh they had 
Um, maybe I would say without being too biased, I would um, say that Rwanda in terms of uh, how far, how, how many entities are using the system are advanced. Uh, but you, you have other countries as well. That is, and this is why the, the comparison is difficult because uh, what we're looking at was not necessarily who, who is where, who, who's not. We're looking at the, the type of challenges people faced, um, how they have solved them, what's working and what's not working. Then we, we drew a number of lessons uh, on uh, what we consider EGP to be successful. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to compare uh, because there are different scenarios. Um, and you have countries like Uganda who has faced issues that Florence highlighted. You have Ethiopia who is um, on a good journey. You have uh, uh, the Nigerian states. You have Zambia who, who are already rolling out the system. So different countries are different levels, uh, but you have those that uh, maybe have gone faster, like Rwanda. But not necessarily. I don't think I would be would be correct to to say that they they, they are the best uh, without being biased. Maybe uh, those who know me they know that I have worked on the system. So I, I'm um, that's a big disclaimer, and, and I will uh, go away from it. So, uh, but I would say that um, the foundations. Uh, some countries have put foundations in a place more than the others. And uh, even with uh, the challenges that uh, the countries like Uganda have made, you, you see the second time around, they are doing it, things properly, and they are on a good course to, to do it. Um, Ethiopia, they have a good vendor who is local. So you can see uh, the way that their system is customized, the, the way they are rolling out uh, fastly, they, they, they probably go further in years to come. And in Nigeria, they, they started last year and they are already publishing data. So it's, it's very encouraging, but of course, we can't shy away from the, the challenges that are being faced. And this is probably why we, we are talking here. So thank you very much for, for, for the work, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you so much to Joyas, Henry, and Florence for joining us today, and to all of you for joining us today for your wonderful engagements and questions. We sincerely hope that this new report and guide will be extremely useful uh, to teams on their EGP journey. And on behalf of the Open Contracting Partnership, please do not hesitate to reach out to us um, you know, to discuss potential support, um, since we really want to see a uh, very successful EGP implementation and open contracting flourishing across uh, the region and the world. Um, so with that, I thank you all for your participation today and hope to see to see you again in the future. Have a good one. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.